If you were to go back in time to the late Pleistocene of Australia, you'd find many amazing and often terrifying animals. Huge carnivorous relatives of the koala, lizards that could devour you in one bite and crocodiles that lived on land. But out of all the continent's extinct animals, one of the weirdest were the dromonithids more commonly known as the demon ducks. These birds would have towered over you at 3 meters tall. Its massive beak and body built like a feathered tank would have left anyone afraid. And yes, as their name suggests they were related to ducks, but they weren't your average waterfowl. The largest of them may have been the heaviest and tallest birds to ever exist. But how did ducks evolve into these nightmarish flightless titans that roamed Australia for over 30 million years? What on earth did they eat? And why did they disappear after thriving for so long? Their story begins in 1872, when British paleontologist Richard Owen received a massive fossil femur from Queensland. He described it as the first member of the family, Dremonithidae, initially thinking he was looking at a ratite like emus or ostriches. Throughout the late 1800s, more fossils turned up across Australia, from Wellington Caves in New South Wales to riverside deposits spread across the continent. Some of the most revealing fossil sites, Riverslay in Queensland, Alcoota and Bullock Creek in the Northern Territory, and Lake Calabona in South Australia, have helped piece together the lives of these enormous birds. Lake Calabona in particular, preserved dozens of near-complete skeletons of Genionis newtoni, the most recent species. Just recently, in 2024, researchers published a nearly complete Genionis skull, from that site, dated to about 50,000 years ago. It offered the clearest window yet into their biology. Its beak was broad and muscular, with jaws able to move independently for precise control. The ear and nasal openings were sealed against water, and the tongue was complex, built for fine, delicate handling of food. All of this painted a new picture, a giant semi-aquatic bird capable of feeding with precision along lake margins and river edges. The so-called demon duck may have spent much of its life wading, not unlike a goose scaled up to monstrous proportions. But figuring out what kind of bird a demon duck actually was took more than a century. Owen's first guess that they were close kin of emus seemed obvious at the time. Australia was already home to big flightless birds, and these fossils matched closely. For decades, Dromonitidae were lumped in with the ratites, but as comparative anatomy advanced, their phylogeny began to unravel. Subtle details of the skull and palate didn't match ratites at all. Some researchers proposed they were instead allied with Gastornis from Europe and North America, another giant bird from the Paleogene. Others linked them to Galliforms, the group containing chickens and turkeys. The debate swung back and forth until the early 21st century, when a combination of molecular and detailed morphological studies resolved the puzzle. The demon ducks, it turned out, were true and seriforms, the same order as ducks, geese, and swans. Their closest living relatives are the South American screamers, odd, loud waterfowl that spend much of their time walking on land and have partially reduced webbing on their feet. It's an unexpected relationship, but it makes sense anatomically, the structure of the palate, the quadrate bone, and the vascular canals of the skull, all align. And seriforms emerged in the late Cretaceous, and after the end Cretaceous extinction, their descendants radiated quickly across the world. Somewhere around 70 to 60 million years ago, one branch split off and migrated southward, reaching Australia while the continent was still connected to Antarctica. Once isolated, these early waterfowl began a long evolutionary experiment. In a land without large placental mammals, and with plenty of ecological room, they grew larger, abandoned flight, and diversified into forms unlike anything else. Gradually, their wings diminished, the breastbone lost its keel for flight muscles, and the ribs shed the braces that once supported flapping. By the late Oligocene, about 26 million years ago, the first recognisable Dromonithids appeared. Through the Miocene, when Australia was much wetter and more forested than today, they flourished. Multiple genera evolved, filling niches from swift, long-legged runners to huge browsers, as tall as a person on horseback. This was convergent evolution at its most impressive. Lineages on different continents, from Gastornis in Europe to the Moa in New Zealand, all following similar paths toward gigantism, once flight was abandoned, yet each did it with a different starting blueprint, and the blueprint of a duck was by far the strangest. The undisputed giant of the group was Dromornis Sturtoni, who lived during the Miocene, standing around 3 meters tall and weighing up to 730 kilograms. It may have been the heaviest bird to ever live. Its legs were pillars of bone, the toes broad and hoof-like to carry its immense weight across firm ground. Whereas Dromonis australis reached about 500 kilograms and Dromonis planei around 400. Yet not all demon ducks were quite so massive. Some lineages went a different way. Illobandornis, Woodburnae, and Illobandornis lossoni were leaner, 
maybe a third the mass of Dromornis, with their longer legs hinting at faster movement across open country. And at the smaller end, Barrowet Hornis Tedfordi weighed under 100 kilograms, tiny compared to its larger cousins, but still outsized compared to nearly every living bird. At the end of the family's history stood Genionis Newtoni, averaging around 230 kilograms and standing 2 to 2.5 meters tall. It was robust but not as gigantic as its Miocene relatives. Surprisingly, the 2024 skull study revealed a head very unlike Dromornis, broader, shorter, and more rounded at the bill tip, closer in profile to a goose indicating that it was more suited for scooping or grazing rather than clipping branches. It also bore a low triangular cask, a bony ridge that likely supported a bright keratin covering. In modern birds, such casks are used for visual signaling, suggesting these animals engaged in social or mating displays. Dimorphism in their bones with males being heavier and more robust also supports the idea that they were a species who displayed complex social behavior. But were they really herbivores? Because across the 20th century there was actually a significant debate as to whether or not they were meat-eating carnivores. Their massive skulls and deep beaks looked intimidating, leading some experts to imagine them as ambush predators. However, as cool as that may seem, the evidence points consistently to a plant-eating lifestyle. One of the biggest giveaways are the gastroliths found in their skeletons. Gastroliths are basically stones that birds swallow to help them grind up plant material. Analysis of isotopes of their bones and eggshells also hinted at herbivory, specifically a diet consisting of vegetation typical of wetter environments. Additionally, wear patterns on their beaks lack the shearing marks of meat-eating species, and instead they show crushing and grinding consistent with fibrous plant matter. The big Dromorna species likely fed much like giant browsing mammals, stripping foliage from trees and shrubs. Whereas in contrast, Genuornis shows clear adaptations for a semi-aquatic existence. Its broad bill, sealed nasal and ear openings, and sensitive jaw joints point to foraging in shallow water, probing mud for roots and aquatic vegetation, just as geese and swans do today. The mixture of aquatic and terrestrial traits would have allowed it to exploit both lakeside vegetation and dryland plants, an advantage in a landscape growing ever more unpredictable. By the mid-Miocene, Australia began a slow transformation. Forests gave way to open woodlands, and by the Pliocene, expanding aridity dominated the interior forcing animals to adapt to longer treks between them. The lighter-built Ilbandornis species may have been better suited to this changing environment, able to move quickly between wetlands. But as the climate oscillated and drought cycles intensified, even they faced growing pressure. The persistence of Genionis into the late Pleistocene, long after most of its relatives vanished, is credited to its specialization. It had found a niche in the shrinking network of lakes and floodplains that still dotted the continent, feeding where water remained year-round. Jamionis Newtoni shared the continent with a cast of other megafauna, Diprotodon, the giant wombat-like herbivore, Thylacolio, the marsupial lion, enormous monitor lizards, and land-dwelling crocodiles. Back then, it was a unique ecosystem of giants, sustained through alternating wet and dry cycles, but then within a few millennia, it suddenly went extinct. The last Jamionis bones date to about 47,000 years ago. This came right after the arrival of a new, much more powerful species on the continent, us. People had arrived roughly 50,000 years ago and slowly spread out across the landmass. Direct evidence of hunting adult Janionis hasn't been found, not a single cut mark or kill site, yet evidence of another kind is rampant. Eggshells, across more than 200 archaeological sites, scientists have found over 100,000 fragments of Janionis eggshell, many blackened by heat. Chemical analysis of their amino acids shows they were exposed to high temperatures consistent with cooking over campfires. The oldest burn shells appear around 54,000 years ago, the youngest about 47,000. After that, they vanish entirely. It doesn't take large-scale hunting to push a species like this over the edge. Large birds reproduce slowly, laying few eggs per season. If even a modest number of eggs were taken each year, population growth could fall below replacement. Modeling suggests that harvesting one or two eggs from a small fraction of nests annually could drive a slow but irreversible decline. At the same time, the climate was becoming drier again. Lakes shrank, vegetation shifted toward open scrub, and seasonal fires became more frequent. Human use of fire for landscape management intensified this shift, turning parts of the continent into grasslands and reducing the diversity of plants that wetlands depended on. For Geniornis, a bird tied to these aquatic habitats, that meant shrinking food sources and fewer safe breeding grounds. The combination of habitat loss, altered fire regimes, and chronic egg predation created a cascade it couldn't withstand. By about 47,000 years ago, the giant duck of Australia was gone. The extinction of Genionis fits a broader pattern repeated around the world, 
when humans reached new continents, the largest, slowest breeding animals often disappeared soon afterward. Mammoths and mastodons in North America, giant ground sloths in South America, moas in New Zealand. Each case involved a blend of human pressure and natural climate change. After people arrived in Australia, the protodon, giant kangaroos, and marsupial lions were wiped out as well. Their extinction wasn't sudden, but the final step in a long battle with a changing world. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider subscribing, and I'll see you in the next one.